what what has been the impact of what is being called postmodernism in terms of the the church that we now deal with? You're speaking to Christians all of the time, uh, and sort of central to postmodernism is there's no such thing as objective truth. Um, do you see the church? Um, eroded because of that, or do you see uh, genuine faith still emerging? No, I think one of the uh, tragic uh, trends in modern life is that the church has embraced the values of the culture. The values of the culture are 64% of Americans, for example, say there's no such thing as truth, absolute truth. 53% of evangelicals say the same thing. So that those of us who claim to be born again, serious Christians, taking our Bible seriously, reading it literally, believing that it instructs and informs our lives can't possibly believe there's no such thing as truth. When Jesus says, I am the truth, all ultimate reality is in the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God. The Word was God. The Word, the Greek word that's used, that's translated as Word, is Logos, which means all reality, everything that can ever be known. How can you believe Jesus is who he says he is and live in the postmodern mind, postmodern world? You can't. You've got to see that there's an absolute thesis and antithesis, and we can't cross that divide. Uh, is it you in one of your books? Uh, I think it is. Maybe it was Yancey. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, the, the point was uh, God goes where he's wanted. How wanted? are those 53, uh, how wanted is God by that 53% of evangelicals who, who, well, who aren't sure there's absolute truth? I don't think they can be, I, I don't think he can be really wanted by them. They're paying respects to him, uh, they go to church, they figure they're doing their religious duty, uh, they look good in society, nice thing to get dressed up on Sunday morning. That's not being a Christian. A Christian is, Bonhoeffer put it very well, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, great book up by my friend Eric Pentaxis. I interviewed him on it. Oh, yeah, it's a great well, book. Eric started to work for me when he got oh. out of Yale. Oh. He came to a meeting once and asked a great question. He's a fabulous yeah. guy, and that's a great book. Yeah. And people need to read it today yeah. because the cultural conditions in the West are not as different as we'd like to think mm -hmm. from Germany in the 1930s. But Bonhoeffer said when, in a book he wrote called Cost of Discipleship, which I read when I was in prison, when Christ calls, he bids a man to come and die. Yeah. And unless you're prepared to die to yourself, yeah. you're going to have trouble calling yourself a Christian. My son-in-law just died in the work of the Lord in Africa. I'm sorry, your son-in-law? My son-in-law just died. Just died? Just died, yeah, oh, just a few months ago. As he was working for the Lord in Africa, I know exactly what you're talking about there. Uh, it's, it's one thing to speak of it as an academic thing, it's another thing to experience it. So I have a 32-year-old widow living with me and three little fatherless kids. Mm. But he sought to do the will of the Lord and in the process lost his life. But speaking of Africa, I was just there. I work in Africa. I just did three days uh, conference with 1,800 young people in Malawi. There's no postmodernism there. I'm wondering, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, is it, just, is it a function of education? Is it a function of materialism? Uh, is it something else? I mean, here, here's 1,800 kids who have this very real sense of right and wrong, of evil and, 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 and goodness, of, of hell and heaven, uh, and they fear the darkness. The most refreshing thing in the world is to go to the third world where people have not been indoctrinated in sophisticated, so-called postmodern, ultimately tolerant thought that there is no truth. I, I know I asked one African pastor once when I was with him, I said, do you have any trouble here teaching that there is such a thing as truth? He said, of course not. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I put my life on the line yeah. preaching here in a country that's got a heavy Muslim population. He said, I wouldn't give my life for something that wasn't the truth. Now, they get it. Yeah. The problem is we're sucked into a culture. But the thing you've got to understand is what is culture? Culture is nothing except the habits and dispositions of the people that is created by the cult, yeah. the belief system. Yeah. So when the belief system is strong, as it is in the global south and the Christian faith, the culture reflects that. Yeah. The problem in the West today is that we have been decaying and and drawing inward as a church at the very time when Christian influence is most needed in society. So we're seeing the culture decay around us 
And as Christians were naively saying, well, wait for the next election, we'll straighten everything out. It's not a question of elections, it's a question of the culture. Politics is an expression of the culture. Politics is sick in the West today, it's the culture. And that's the cult. So that's us. Are you, are you surprised that there may be as many believers in China today as there are in the United States of America? No, I think in actual count, if you looked at the Chinese church, which is somewhere between 80 and 100 million, depending on the estimates, some people say 120, uh, there probably are more true Christians in China than there are in the United States. And I'm not surprised at all, because they've had to pay a price for their faith. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a, it's an irony, isn't it? That the, the, more, the more pressure on the, on the community of faith, the, the faith thrives. It's been the case for 2,000 years. Yeah. It's not any different today. And what we think about as grace becomes often cheap grace, yeah. as Bonhoeffer put it again, to quote him. It has to be costly grace. It has to cost you everything yeah. or you're not going to respect. Yeah. If you get something for free, yeah. do you really treat it well? Yeah. No. Yeah. You can throw it away. But if you have to give your life for something, you, you fight to the end for it. What has ministry to the prisoner done to you personally? Well, it's totally transformed me because I've been surrounded by the most powerless people in the world. I also have an autistic child in my family, a grandson whom I love dearly, who mm. would be eliminated by mm. the eugenicists, mm. which are back in our midst and right. active and talking loudly. Yeah. Uh, weeding out the defectives, uh, the curse that comes upon us when we stop respecting life in every stage. But to be among the prisoners, I, I've kind of absorbed their view of life. You see life differently from the other side of society. From the bottom of society looking up when I was in prison, you see something very different than you do when you're in the top side of society looking down. And you never quite forget it. You'll never get over the experience of losing your son. And tragic though it is, God will use that in powerful ways with you. I, you know, you asked me about power corrupting, absolutely. Power corrupted me, absolutely, in the White House and could again today with ease. I recognize that. The only thing that keeps me from it today is that I spend so much time with people who are powerless and disenfranchised that I, I can't shake their point of view. And I, I kind of know it's real because somebody will come to me, as people do at this conference, and say, oh, you're such a hero of mine. And I cringe. I absolutely, literally cringe because I know I'm not. I mean, I know who I am. You were chief counsel to Richard Nixon. Um, did Watergate affect your view of him at all, or um, were you a band of brothers and you, 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 you all knew uh, everything about each other as it related to that whole situation? Well, the White House is never a band of brothers, even when it looks like that from the outside. No. Everybody walks with their back to the wall because if I get FaceTime with Nixon, as I got it, used to have it in and out of his office all yeah. the time, uh, every, the, it's the, neither, neither the long knives. Everybody's out to cut you down. So it is dog-eat-dog -dog in the White House. There's no camaraderie. Uh, it's, I, came, I came out of the Marine Corps uh, experience where there's a real bonding, semper fidelis. You're loyal, faithful. There was nothing like that in the White House. And there hasn't been in any White House that I've had any experience with. Bush came closer to it than most people. Uh, and the reason is power drives the, the whole process. So you don't want to see somebody else succeed. Uh, you want to succeed at their expense. You're having your uh, international uh, conference, you call it conference or? Convocation. Convocation, yeah. right here in Toronto. Uh, why Canada? We've been here three years in a row, uh, have a wonderful reception here from the Canadians. Uh, we love it, it's a great environment. This is a very cosmopolitan city. Somebody said it's New York run by the Swiss. And it really is. It's a lovely place yeah. to have a conference. Yeah. It's also a convenient destination for people flying. But I think it is a sign of something deeper. Uh, Americans, I speak for myself, but, but I know yeah. others who think the same thing, have always looked upon Canada as sort of our poor cousin to the north. Right. Well, you're better off financially than we are. Yeah. And you're growing and you're developing natural resources, which we've refused to do. Yeah. Uh, a lot of Americans look at Canada today kind of longing, and uh, you've been the canary in the, in the mine shaft for the church because we've seen the church liberalized and attacked in Canada, uh, and now we're getting it ourselves in the States. Uh, we've learned a little bit from you guys, but I think we're, uh, we really feel a, we feel a brotherly bond with Canadians, Americans do anyway, despite the rivalries between us. 
but we're now particularly so because you've done such a good job managing debt and uh, it's a wonderful culture. It's a beautiful place to live. Beautiful resources. Uh, last last uh, question. Um, tell me about your family. In, in, in your book, uh, The Faith, you wrote about both your son, one of your sons and your daughter having cancer at the same time, yeah. autistic grandchild. How are your family doing? Our family is doing great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, every family's got problems. Yeah. But uh, my daughter has really blossomed. Uh, she's written a book of her own, Dancing with Max, about her autistic son. That's a wonderful book. She's been mm -hmm. out preaching with me. I, mm -hmm. A great experience going to uh, uh, Willow Creek and doing all three services with mm -hmm. my daughter. I did the eight minute setup for her and she <laughs> did the talk and she was a better speaker than I am with a great message, yeah. a great response from the crowd. So that's very satisfying. Yeah. My wife has had major surgery this year, mm -hmm. come through it flying colors. Both of my boys now are in great health and doing well and building wonderful families. Got a rebellious granddaughter. <laughs> Everybody does that. That means she's got a brain. Yeah, right. <laughs> how, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, better than I deserve. You're turning 80 this year. I will. Well, it's been a pleasure having you. Thank and, you very uh, much for having me. You've uh, got a very busy life, and it really means a lot to us that you've spent some time with us. I'm happy to do it. This is a great program. I've been on over the years a number of times, as you well know, and I think it's terrific. I wow. think it's a great outreach, and thank God you're, in, you're staying with it. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much. Thanks.